Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Hear now the word of the true and living God. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do this. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the prophet Isaiah for your word written and recorded millennia ago. And yet you have kept and preserved it so that we can see here what Isaiah saw in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Help us to see it clearly and to get a a glimpse of the glory of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we approach the end of the year, we begin a series of sermons. We're going to put Ephesians on pause. We'll come back to that. Uh, But I want us to begin a series of lessons that will lead us up to Christmas called Good News for Christmas. You know, there's a lot of bad news these days. Uh, And what we need and what I think the world needs is a bit of good news for Christmas. And so we're going to focus on the Gospels, one per week leading up. The thing is, there's five weeks from now until Christmas Eve Day, which is a Sunday this year. And so I want us to look at the fifth Gospel this morning. And maybe you saw the title of the sermon in the bulletin. Maybe you hear me talk about the fifth Gospel and you think, fifth Gospel? Boy, Nick's really lost it now, right? My Bible only has four Gospels. There... There's Nick, his his learning has driven him out of his mind, and well, I refer to the fifth gospel in the way that many have talked about the fifth gospel, being Isaiah the prophet. The book of Isaiah is rich, it's absolutely soaked with the, uh, the, the, the promise of a Messiah, that Christ is coming. And it starts way back in chapter 2 with this vision of the kingdom, goes into chapter 7 with this promise about a virgin who will bear a son, picked up by Matthew in his gospel and applied to Christ. Our text this morning in chapter 9, chapter 25, uh, of course, Isaiah 53. Uh, and, And indeed, all of the section from chapter 40 to 55 is about this servant of Yahweh. And of course, you have in there the suffering of that servant in chapter 53. Just a, a, a book of the Bible, a prophet who caught a glimpse of the glory of the servant of Yahweh. And so when I talk about the fifth gospel, I'm referring to the book of Isaiah, who some 700 years before Christ ever walks the planet, Isaiah is announcing the good news of the kingdom of the Messiah. And in that way, he is the fifth gospel. God, in the book of Isaiah, specifically our text this morning, verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 9, God is pointing us to the goodness of Christmas by prophesying Christ's kingdom. What's so good about the kingdom of Christ? Well, here in our text, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, God prophetically reveals His good intentions that will come through the rule and reign of Messiah. It begins there in the first few phrases of verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This child, this son, is given. And that is 
He is given by God. Here, in the first place, is God's good gift at Christmas, and that is the gift of this child, which is indeed His Son. He is the gift that God gives to us. To us. You get that repeated there. God's gift, by the way, to us is a child, a son. It's a person. That is God's good gift to us. A person, a child, even His own son. That is who God gives. You see, the the best gift that God could give us is His Son. And He did not withhold Him. God has given His Son. He has done just this in giving us His Son. This child is born. Born here points, of course, to the miraculous birth of Christ. It is true that Christ comes in the world just like any other child. He's born. And yet, He comes in a very unusual manner. Because while He had an earthly mother, He had no earthly father. This is exactly what Isaiah predicts, uh, predicted just a few, uh, well, a couple chapters earlier, a few verses, a handful of verses, really, in the grand scheme of things. Back in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Matthew picks up on this in his Gospel, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, and says, What Isaiah predicted has come to fruition and fulfillment in Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of that prophecy of a virgin who will give birth, and that, of course, is Christ. We also see that He is given to us. Given by the Father to us. This is heaven's gift to us. Jesus is the gift of the Heavenly Father. He is, again, God's good gift to us. He is given to us, but He's also given for us. For us. That is, in our place. He's given for our good. He's given for our salvation, for our redemption. He's given as an example, but He's also given as a sacrifice for us. A sacrifice for our sins. And so in this way, Jesus is the gracious gift of God for the redemption and the salvation of all of God's people, both Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. His blood covers all of the people of God across time and space. And so, again, this is God's good gift. It's His own Son. But then we get a glimpse of the good character of this one who is given by God. In the rest of verse 6, the government shall be upon his shoulder. File that away. We'll come back to that in a moment. His name shall be called. It could also be translated his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Each of these names as it were, reveal the character of this son, this child who is to come. First, he's a wonderful counselor. There's a sense in which everything about Jesus is wonderful. Everything about Jesus is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His works are wonderful. His grace is wonderful. But here, his counsel is especially noteworthy. He's a wonderful counselor. During his earthly ministry, you think of all the counsel that Jesus gave to people, especially to his followers. He counseled people to turn from their sins. He counseled people to believe in him. He counseled the weary to come to him that they might find rest. He counseled people, sin no more. He counseled people to be humble. And now that counsel has been codified has been recorded for all history and for His posterity for all time so that we might come back to His Word and the eternal wisdom of this wonderful Counselor. We can come to the Word of God and we can still hear the Counsel as it is contained and made known in this this Word, this, this Bible that we have. 
And so the wonderful counselor continues to counsel us to love one another. He continually counsels us to abide in Him, to pray to the Father in His name, to bear fruit. Our wonderful counselor counsels us of all the blessings that are to be found in Him, the blessings of forgiveness and redemption and all these things. Yeah, He's, he's a wonderful counselor. Not only that, He's also the mighty God. This is a full affirmation of the deity of Christ. That Christ is as much God as God is God. This is the same title that is used, by the way, for Yahweh. In the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 18, he says, the prophet Jeremiah says, you, talking about God, Yahweh God, Lord Yahweh, in verse 17, as he is called, you show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them, O great and mighty God, whose name is Yahweh of hosts. And now notice the same title, Mighty God, is applied to the Son that the Father gives. He is 100% fully God, even the mighty God. All the works of Christ speak to this. We remember that Christ was at work in creation. All things are created by Him. Well, that kind of creative power is ascribed to the mighty God alone. Not only that, but all of Christ's work in providence, seeing to it that all things hold together. Christ is at work in that. We can think about the, the power of the mighty God, Christ, in His miracles. And certainly we think about the miracles that He performed during His earthly ministry. But we keep in mind, it is Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, in Jude verse 5, who says that Jesus saved a people out of Egypt. Talk about a miracle in bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea. Jude says Jesus did that. And then also the powerful work of Christ in redeeming people, forgiving people of their sins, the power that is at work in His resurrection. All of this speaks to Christ as the mighty God. So guess what? We worship Christ as God to the glory of God the Father. He is the mighty God. The next one's uh, it can be tricky, given our translation, everlasting Father. Uh-oh, are we confusing the Son with the Father? Uh, the, the Hebrew phrase can also be translated as Father of eternity. And I think that's probably uh, more in view here. It speaks to the fact that Christ is over eternity. And indeed, the eternality and the infiniteness of the Son is in view here. That He is over eternity itself. That He fathers eternity, as it were. And so that is why He can be called the King Eternal, Immortal, uh, in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And again, it, since this points to the eternality of Christ, it demonstrates that He existed before the world was. He's always been just as the Father has always been, just as the Holy Spirit has always been. Also, uh, the fact that He is the Father of eternity could speak to the fact that He's the author of eternal life. And, and by His resurrection, He secured that eternal life for His people. And finally, He's the Prince of Peace. This last name, Prince of Peace. Prince. Uh, remember... I mentioned we're going to come back to that phrase there about the government being upon his shoulders. All this talk about government, it, it demonstra it's, ma it's manifest right here as well in this title of Prince of Peace. It is a prince who has a kingdom, who has a government, and that's emphasized here in this title of Prince of Peace. And so where the government, the kingdom of Christ is established, peace rules and reigns there in the hearts and minds of the people of Christ. We know, of course, about, we've, we've studied Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul points to the fact that Christ is the end of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. We've been, they've been reconciled into one body, and that one body's been reconciled to the Father. It is also true that 
Christ will be the Prince of Peace over His people no matter what walk of life they come from, what, what ethnicity they may be. Christ is the end of hostility between black and white and also between black on black. He's also the end of hostility between uh, the Jewish people and the Palestinian people. He's the end of hostility between Russian and Ukraine. People uh, hand-wringing over what are we going to do about these situations in the world, Christ is the answer to that. He is the Prince of Peace. It is the gospel that will be the end of hostility between all of the various ethnic groups in the world. It comes to an end under the reign and rule of the Prince of Peace. Only Christ can give people spiritual peace so that it will issue forth in peace among people. And so He is the Prince of Peace. Again, this is the good character of God's good gift. And now we come to verse 7. Remember I said, keep in mind, the government shall be upon His shoulder. Here, this is accentuated further where there is this talk about His government, the increase of His government. And so you need, first of all, to recognize the gift. The gift is the prince. He's the ruler. He's the king over this government. But also, it is his character which is the foundation for this government, this kingdom. Again, all of it comes back to who Christ is, his identity, and what he establishes in the world. He comes to bring God's good government into the world. First, we acknowledge the reality of the government. That's that phrase back in verse 6 about the government shall be upon his shoulder. It's His. It's, it's on Him. Um, Christ is Lord over all. He rules the nations. And especially here, the government that is in view certainly is His kingdom, and He certainly rules over His people in a special way, in a particular way. And so in view here could be the church, that, that He rules over the hearts and minds of his people. He brings them into submission. He establishes His rule among His people. Uh, as, as we come into the kingdom, we bow the knee to King Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. And then He exercises His headship over His church, sees to it that we have the things that we need. And then also, we know, as from our study from Ephesians, that He is head over all things to or for His church. And He is, again, at work providentially seeing to it that His church has what she needs. And also, He's at work to protect His church, to see to it that His church never goes out of existence, that the gates of Hades never prevail against it. He does this by bringing all of His enemies to heal, by putting His uh, boot on the neck of all of his enemies. This is why, again, Psalm 110, God's favorite Bible verse, how uh, God says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make all of your enemies a footstool for your feet. And by the way, the government is on his shoulder. His, his shoulder is the only one big enough to shoulder the load. No human being uh, can uh, properly discharge the duty of the vast empire, which is the kingdom of God. But Christ can, uh, because as we've seen, He is the mighty God. So it, it exists, this government does, the kingdom of Christ. But then there's also the increase of Christ's government. Verse 7, of the increase of His government and of peace, there will be no end. Now, we're going to talk about the duration of Christ's kingdom in just a moment, but immediately you see this government of the Prince of Peace, it, it doesn't go out of business. It, it, is, it has no end. It is eternal. It is, well, it has no end. But also, I want to draw our attention here especially to the increase of it. The increase of Christ's government, it is ever increasing. He is expanding the borders of His kingdom even now as, as we study His Word, as, as I speak. His kingdom is expanding its borders. Think about it, historically. When we think about the kingdom of Christ, 
it's true, he rules over everything. He's king of the cosmos. But again, we're especially focused on the kingdom in its relation to the church, and, and the church as the expression of the rule and reign of Christ in the hearts and minds of people. It had a small start. It started in Jerusalem with just a, first a handful of followers. And then you read about 3,000 people are obedient to Christ. And then 5,000 people are obedient to Christ. And so uh, after his ascension, you, you have these waves of Jewish converts, but it doesn't stop there. You begin to see an Ethiopian eunuch find his place in the kingdom in Acts chapter 8. You see this Gentile Cornelius find his place in the kingdom. And then there's more and more Gentiles who start flowing into the kingdom as, as people here and there start coming into. And then as the church begins its mission work and expanding out into the, the Roman Empire, you begin to see converts in Ephesus, in Philippi, uh, in, in Rome, the very capital of the empire. And, and you see all of these Christians, Jews and Gentiles, coming in. The kingdom is increasing. And of course, historically, we see that wherever the gospel has gone, it has found a favorable hearing as people hear this message of salvation, as sinners hear the message of salvation. And they hear about the grace of God. God, by His Spirit, forms new hearts in people. They believe in Christ. They repent of their sins. They're obedient to Christ. Uh, and and uh, they're baptized. And, and they follow after Jesus. And, and they find peace with God. Upward. And then they begin to find peace with one another. Outward. And they find peace with themselves. An inward peace. That passes understanding. Think of how many Christians there are today compared to when it first started. We bear witness to the fact that Christ's kingdom, His government is ever increasing as more and more people hear the gospel and as they're obedient to Christ and they find their place in the kingdom. We have this promise 700 years, over 700 years, before Jesus ever walked the planet that he would have a kingdom, his government would be ever increasing. And what do we see? It's born out in history. As the church, you can find Christ's church the world over. People all over the world worshiping him today. Yes, it is ever increasing, and it will continue to increase. We see the stability of this government uh, in the phrase here about uh, uh, on the throne, David and his kingdom, and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it. To establish it and to uphold it. And, and by the way, the throne of David, that's more the government language. Who but a king has a throne. And so the, the prince of peace is going to sit on David's throne. And, and his kingdom is established and upheld. Who establishes this and, and who upholds it? It's God. And we're going to see this at the end of verse 7 about the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do it. Not, you know, if, if things go right and, man, if things just start falling into place and, and, and if humans are, are fully cooperative with God, then maybe, perhaps, hopefully, God will do it. No! The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do it. No if ands, or buts about it, God will see to it. But here the stability of it is that, um, well, since it's a divine enterprise, this is God's doing, uh, then what we see here is that uh, the triune God will establish and will uphold this kingdom, this government of the Son. And no human institution... No other human government is going to be able to stop it. We could talk about the Roman Empire trying to squash it, trying to stamp it out. And, well, the Roman Empire went the way of the dodo, and here's the kingdom of Christ today, still in existence. Um, and it will, it will establish, it will be upheld, not only against human opposition. Do you think the devil's happy about what he sees God doing in this world? And the gates of Hades from time to time will rise up against the kingdom of heaven. The gates of Hades will not prevail. The devil will not stop 
the good work of our God and of His Christ, and the kingdom will be established and will be upheld. No opposition, whether human or angelic, will be able to stop and and shake the stability of the kingdom of Christ. The foundation of Christ's kingdom is seen in the phrase that uh, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. Justice and righteousness. These these terms often appear together in Scripture. Uh, They go together. And what is in view here is the justice and the righteousness of God. It is God's justice, not some uh, human idea of what justice ought to be, which is often rooted in power structures and things like that. God's justice has to do with His standard for morality. His righteousness is rooted in His very character. He's the righteous God. But then, of course, the justice and the righteousness of Christ comes into view. The righteousness of Christ is is what uh, will be the foundation of Christ's kingdom. And indeed, it is that righteousness that's part of the good news that we have that is credited to us. It is, it is external to us. Why Paul in Philippians will talk about, I don't want to be found with my own righteousness. He wants, and indeed he has, the righteousness of Christ. When earthly governments get away from God's standard for morality, or get away from Christ's code of conduct, in other words, when they get away from what God has revealed in Scripture, that's when things don't go well for that nation. That is when the just judgment of God falls upon that nation. Listen, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The wise man says this in Proverbs 14 and verse 34. And so God will not be mocked. This is why we as the church need to call our leaders, our magistrates, to uphold God's standard for righteousness. Uh, Why it is incumbent upon us to call... Uh, civil leaders to fulfill their God-given duty. It is God who put them there in the first place. Rule in a way that is consistent with God's standard for conduct. Unfortunately, not many of our leaders are keen on listening to what God has revealed. What can we expect from that? Well, we can expect what every government that has gotten away from God's Word has seen, and that is the just judgment of God Good news. Christ's kingdom prevails. No matter what happens to whatever government we're talking about, whether it be the American government or what have you, Christ's kingdom, Christ's government, well, there's no end to it. (laughs) It is forevermore. But the foundations are, again, the justice and righteousness of God. Uh, Speaking of the duration of Christ's kingdom, that's seen in the very next phrase, from this time forth and forevermore, right? This is paralleled with there will be no end, okay? No end to Christ's kingdom. Um, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. The, what Isaiah sees here is what Daniel saw in his vision in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. There it says that his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And, and again, that's, that is what we see. It's been 2,000 years running and Christ... No one gets to take his crown. He's not running for office. His kingdom, the borders continue to expand the world over. This is why Peter calls it in 2 Peter 1 and verse 11, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ has no rival. There will be no successor after him. All other kingdoms will end. His dominion continues forever. And by the way, well, that's good news, right? Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. And by the way, it's our God who's responsible for raising up kings and bringing kings down. Christ's kingdom is eternal. He is king forevermore. The last phrase there in verse 7 demonstrates the certainty of this. The certainty of Christ's government. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do this. Everything, everything in this phrase points to the certainty that God will establish. God Himself, according to His zeal, His passion for His Son, by the way. In other words, because the Father loves the Son, 
He will see to it that this will happen. <clears throat> the fervency with which God strives to accomplish His will is the foundation for the establishment of Christ's kingdom. I mean, can, can we honestly imagine that God would fail to bring His Christ and Christ's kingdom into the world? That when, when God promises here that there will be an, an ever-increasing aspect to the kingdom of Christ, that God will fall short of that? That He'll somehow be stymied? Of course not. It would be ridiculous, right? What God has purposed and what God has promised will come to pass and indeed is coming to pass. The Father has entrusted all things into the hands of the Son. For what purpose? That people honor the Son in the same way that they honor the Father. Those who do not kiss the Son, as Psalm 2 points out, they, all they face is the wrath of the Son and of the Father as well. And so as, as the gospel goes into the world, Christ's rule and His reign is established. His kingdom takes territory from the evil one. Hearts are changed. Lives are changed. People are converted. Brothers and sisters, the certainty of this is our guarantee that we can't fail. That, uh, that as God's Word goes out into the world, it will accomplish all the purpose for which He sends it. This is a foundation for our boldness when it comes to the proclamation of the gospel. We need not fear uh, looking foolish or being thought of as uh, dim-witted or anything like that. The wisest thing that a person can do is bow the knee to King Jesus. We've done that. And all we're doing is, well, it's like one person said, we're, we are beggars telling other beggars where they can find bread. We are those who were once in darkness but are now in light, telling others who are in darkness where they can find light. This is the evangelistic enterprise. And since it is God Himself who guarantees the results, we, meet, we need only be faithful in telling others the gospel. In the middle of the 16th century, the Spanish army laid siege to the little town of St. Quentin. This was a town in the backwaters of France. And things were going poorly for the French Huguenots who had, who had, who'd, who'd, uh, they'd, they'd uh, hold up in that village. The ramparts were ruined. Uh, fever and famine were decimating the town's defenders. There were treasonous elements uh, in the midst of their number, they were threatening the internal stability. And so one day, the Spaniards were launching, they fired a shower of arrows into this little French town where all these French Huguenots were holed up. And, and each of those arrows had a little slip of parchment that had been attached to it. And the parchment said uh, that... Well, they promised, the Spaniards did, that if the French would give up, they would survive. And their lives would be spared, their property would be spared. The governor of the town was a man named Gaspard de Coligny. He was a leader among the Huguenots. And he took a piece of that parchment, and he wrote two words on it. He tied it to a javelin, and he hurled it back at the Spaniards. The two words that he had written were regem habemus. We have a king. That was the answer by those French Huguenots to the Spanish threats. We have a king. Brothers and sisters, while we're here on earth, we have a powerful foe. He is continually, regularly showering us with his flaming darts. And on a, a, a part of it, is he's promising that, look, if, if you'll just give up this Christian enterprise, I'll give you greatness. I'll give you possessions. I'll give you ease of life. The devil tempts us to give up the battle, to stop fighting, and to just drift into worldliness. If you do that, man, things will go well with you. Things will go well for you if you would just give up. 
And it's not the devil and all of his hordes. It's also the world. And the world has a siren call that it is crying out to us. This world and the things of this world. And they question, why are you so stuffy? Why are you such a prude? Why not see things our way? Why not do things like us? We have... Listen, if you'll just do things like us, you'll have such a better time. you have so much f- more fun. You'll be less stressed out if you will just give in. And brothers and sisters, when you hear the siren call of the world, and when you hear the promises of the devil, grab hold of the certainty of these promises here in Isaiah. The certainty and the reality of Christ's eternal kingdom. And answer the lies of the devil, and the lies of the world with this truth. Ready? We have a king. I have a king, and his name is Jesus. Let's commit this to prayer. Unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be dominion and glory forever and ever. Lord God, we thank You for King Jesus. We pray that by the eyes of faith, we would see the ever-increasing glory of Christ's kingdom, that we ourselves would be faithful in the proclamation of the Gospel, that we, when tempted, would resolve to make the good confession that Christ is Lord, that Christ is King, even my King. We give you praise, honor, and glory through the incomparable name of Jesus. Amen.